Now, as I have commented in years past, I struggle with preparing remarks for this conference, and I've tried to explain to people why it's difficult and they don't. Uh, it's counterintuitive, I acknowledge, but uh, because the topic area is so general, it's actually a little bit more daunting at many of the technical conferences that I appear. Uh, I'm assigned a much narrower topic, and I think it's easier to assess what would be of use to the audience because there's a much clearer technical purpose for which they've gathered. So I must say uh, this, is, uh, this is my sixth Rick speech. Uh, I know if you're doing the mathematics, Eric just stated that I came in March of 2008, but I really didn't want to get sworn in and two days later have to give a Rick speech, so I waited, I think, very wisely until the end of the month uh, to be, uh, arrive as an NRC commissioner. So. I was thinking creatively to myself that if the difficulty that I had this year is any gauge, uh, if I get up to Rick's speeches like 8, 9, and 10, I was joking with myself of, you know, what possibly could I do? And I was thinking I could maybe uh, play the violin or I could do an interpretive dance of the 10 CFR. That was the thought I had. Neither of which, or it could be an interpretive dance to Commissioner Apostolakis' favorite new reg. We could ask him what new reg he would like interpreted through movement. Um, but none, none of those things would be very pretty, so I hope it doesn't come to that. Now, I'm, I'm told that Commissioner McGaffigan, uh, perhaps as he progressed uh, through the later years of his service on the commission, and he was the longest serving member of the commission, if I have the history right, he would sometimes pen his remarks for this conference on a notepad as he sat listening to the presenters who came before him. And, and people who know us both have made comparisons between our work styles, which is very flattering to me and probably pro a profound injustice to Commissioner McGaffigan. But uh, I really would just lack that. Would, that's a very nervy thing to be able to go, oh, I'm just going to write some notes down and, and go up there. I wish you all could see the view from up here. It is really impressive uh, to have this many of you come these distances to be a part of this conference. But uh, So I cut it a little bit close uh, this year. I'm not all the way to the McGaffigan style. I wasn't penning it as Allison w was talking earlier, but I do and have had all my life a little bit of a difficulty with uh, procrastination. I do. Maybe I'm uh, people who procrastinate say, I'm just one of those people, you know, I really, I'm good in, in, under the crunch time and in a pressure cooker. But one of my favorite um, monologues about uh, procrastination came from the comedian Ellen DeGeneres, and I've talked about her humor other times. I think she's uh, really got a wonderful sense of humor, but she described in a stand-up act she had one time about that feeling you get when you sit at your computer, you know you need to work on a, a, a writing, a creative work product, and um, the sudden irresistible urge you feel to do things like alphabetizing your compact discs or, um, you know, then you uh, decide you're going to go downstairs for a little bit so you encounter your cat on the staircase and then your cat leans over and wants to belly rub and so you do that and about 45 minutes later then you go downstairs and uh, you know then you, you go well okay I am getting a drink of water I'm gonna get back at it I'm going right up there and getting back on the computer and you you have that drink of water you have the drink of water and you're you're in your kitchen and you look around and you go I need to paint this kitchen <laughs> So I didn't paint the kitchen on Sunday, but let me, I want to give you some flavor of the things I felt compelled to do on Sunday while I was really serious about preparing these remarks. I have lived in my current home for over 12 years now on Sunday. This is a true story. I'm giving you a real feeling for, for my issue with procrastination. Uh, I felt compelled to take some wall hangings and decorative items that I have for 12 years not had the commitment to place and hang on the wall in the various locations where they go, I hung them on Sunday. Uh, and this, I think, though, stands as a seminal act of procrastination. If there were a Hall of Fame of procrastinators, I would put this story up there. I would include it with uh, whoever sent in a nomination for me in that Hall of Fame. I prepared and filed my taxes as an act of procrastination against preparing these remarks. My taxes are not due for some time. And so I was actually overcoming tax season procrastination just 
to, to I couldn't bust bust through my procrastination on this on this thing. But I mean, what does that say when your guilty pleasure that you're the intervening thing that you're not working on what you're supposed to be working on is that you did your taxes? So I think uh, if anyone can top that. So it gets to be 11 o'clock at night on Sunday, and uh, I've taken time out, of course, to watch. The Walking Dead, followed by The Talking Dead, which is a one-hour show that analyzes The Walking Dead episode that you just watched. <laughs> and so I finally broke down and called my brother and said, I am so behind on this thing. I just really need to get this done. And, and in a piece of very sage older brother wisdom, he said to me, Tuesday? Well, you still have 24 hours, Christine. You can pull that out. So, um, I, he also found my description of my writer's block so interesting uh, that he goes, you should talk about that. And so, so that's what I've done. So I want to say thanks uh, to my brother. And on an interesting sidebar, on the point of I was joking with him about maybe I should do an interpretive dance. I kind of ran that by him. Um, he reminded me. I thought I was making a joke, and I thought it was the most ridiculous thing. And I thought he'd get a laugh, which he did. But then he listened to me and he paused and he said, didn't you once do an interpretive dance at a family Thanksgiving? And he, I had forgotten I did it. One of my nephews had had to write a school essay on gratitude. And in order to, his mother, my sister-in-law, wanted him to read it. So to make it a little more interesting, I agreed to interpret his essay as he was reading it through movement. And it was really an enjoyable Thanksgiving memory for a lot of people. I, I'm glad there's nobody videotaped it, thanks, thank goodness. So. So our families are really great uh, for this type of wisdom, at least in my experience. They know us well, and having known us for a long time, they look past, uh, you know, not only what we think we are and all the trappings of that, but, uh, you know, any kind of illusions we have about ourselves. And, and I say wisdom there because wisdom is very different than knowledge, and uh, I draw a distinction, and I'm worried that wisdom is considered kind of a folksy thing that's undervalued. I've heard the distinction between the two described in a way I like. It says, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. <laughs> so at this point, having talked about wisdom, I should apply some wisdom and resist telling a science joke. I mean, a lot of you were hitting me up even this morning. And uh, I think one of the benefits of serving this long on the commission is that I have crystallized now on the piece of advice that I would give a new commissioner. And maybe I didn't really come to this until hmm, last year, this year for sure. But I would tell them, don't ever tell a joke at the regulatory information conference or with something that will just plague you for the rest of your time. However, for me, I would have to say there is no turning back. So to those of you, and I'm not sure you're a majority, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to indulge you. I do get submittals all year long. That's another fun thing about telling a joke at the RIC. And I appreciate the submittals. The judging process is highly subjective because it is just whatever I think uh, is funny. And I do get overlap in the submittals, but I am going to credit this one to the man sitting up on the stage with me, Eric Leeds. I don't know if you recall this. It's good to get extra credit points with your moderator because he's going through those note cards like a riverboat gambler over there. He's just <laughs> loading it up for me. Um, but Eric, you sent me this in July of last year because I have the email. Here goes. A photon checks into a hotel and the bellman asks him if he has any luggage. No, the photon replies, I'm traveling light. <laughs> Why are you groaning, Eric? You sent it to me. <laughs> That's not right. Now, I've been told that um, joke telling is fundamentally storytelling, and I, I really think that's the source of its power. Uh, in her TED talk, the Nigerian author Chumamando Idikia says that stories are how we make meaning of our lives. She says that stories are necessary, just as necessary as food or love. And she says while stories have the power to dispossess and malign, they also have the power to repair broken dignity. But she cautions that if we want to understand a person or event, we cannot know just one thing. 
something she terms the danger of the single story. She explains it this way. Idikia grew up in Nigeria, reading a lot of British children's books, and when she was old enough to write stories of her own, they were, as she describes it, full of children who were white and blue-eyed, who played in the snow, who ate apples, and who talked a lot about the weather and how wonderful it would be that the, weather was the sun was shining. Because, as she puts it, stories had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. When she started reading African stories, she learned that girls like her could also exist in literature. She says, it saved me from having a single story. And when we reject the falseness of the single story, we, we regain a kind of paradise. In the course of my journeys this year, I met someone whose work is also attempting to defy the myth of the single story. At the World Nuclear Association Conference in London this past September, I heard a woman speak as part of a panel on public communications. Her name is Susie Hobbs-Baker, and she has talked about the work she is doing both individually and as part of the Nuclear Literacy Project, which can be found at nuclearliteracy.org, through which she is using her unique voice to reclaim and reframe a public policy dialogue about nuclear issues. To do this, she uses her training in the disciplines of the visual arts, as well as the prism of her own experiences. Whether or not you agree with her viewpoint, if you visit her website, I think you would find her voice unique. She and her peers in the project seem to have as their aim engaging their own generation on existing topics in unique ways with the goal of raising basic literacy in the underlying science and technology concepts. I have seen something similar when I've spoken with the young generation in nuclear groups at some of the power plants I have visited during the last year. The incoming generation of nuclear professionals is bringing new energy to issues that their predecessors have long decided are simply too entrenched and too stale for continued fruitful dialogue. Like many in their generation, they are not content to take our word for it. So I ask this question, as the current generation of leaders in this profession, what is the value to us of this new dialogue? And if we think it has value, should be, we be working to empower the next generation in their undertaking? Today is, of course, the three-year anniversary of the tragic tsunami and earthquake in Japan. Our hearts still break for our colleagues, our friends, and their families. And our minds still struggle to find meaning in the face of the suffering created by this natural disaster, the nuclear portion of which was only one element. In the Sunday Review of the New York Times in September of last year, there was published an opinion piece by Pico Ayer, who is a distinguished presidential fellow at Chapman, Chapman University, but he's also an acclaimed travel writer who has lived and traveled around the world. In describing his, his work, it has been said that he began his career documenting a neglected as aspect of travel, the sometimes surreal disconnect between local tradition and imported global pop culture. Since then, he has written 10 books exploring, among other topics, the cultural consequences of isolation. Ayer's latest focus is on yet another overlooked aspect of travel. How can it help us gain our sense of stillness and focus in a world where our devices and digital networks increasingly distract us? About this, he writes the following. Almost everybody I know has this sense of overdosing on information and getting dizzy living at post-human speeds. Nearly everybody I know does something to try to remove herself, to clear her head, and to have enough time and space to think. All of us instinctively feel that something inside us is crying out for more spaciousness and stillness to offset the exhilarations of this movement and the fun and diversion of the modern world. In a very different vein from that work, however, the piece that drew my attention to this author was entitled, The Value of Suffering. In it, Ayer writes, wise men in every tradition tell us that suffering brings clarity, illumination. For the Buddha, suffering is the first rule of life, and insofar as some of it arises from our own wrongheadedness, our cherishing of self, we have the cure for it within. I once met, he says, a Zen-trained painter in Japan in his 90s, 
who told me that suffering is a privilege. It moves us towards thinking about essential things and shakes us out of short-sighted complacency. When he was a boy, he said it was believed you should pay for suffering. It proves such a hidden blessing. Ayer goes on to write, as Kobayashi Isu, a haiku master in the 18th century, put it, the world of dew is a world of dew, and yet, and yet. Known for his words of constant affirmation, this haiku master had seen his mother die when he was two, his first son die, his father contract typhoid fever, his next son and a beloved daughter die. He knew that impermanence is our home and loss, the law of the world. Ayer writes that my neighbors in Japan live in a culture that is based at some invisible level on the Buddhist precepts that Isa knew. That suffering is reality, even if unhappiness need not be our response to it. This makes for what comes across to us as uncomplaining hard work, stoicism, and a constant sense of the ways difficulty binds us together. I'll do my best and I'll stick it out and it can't be helped are the phrases you hear every hour in Japan, he writes. When a tsunami claimed thousands of lives north of Tokyo, now three years ago, I heard much more lamentation and panic in California than among my neighbors in Kyoto. My neighbors aren't formal philosophers, but much more in the texture of the lives they're used to is the national worship of things falling away in autumn, the blaze of cherry blossoms followed by their very quick departure, the haiku poems on which they're schooled, these things speak volumes for an old culture's training and saying goodbye to things and putting delight and beauty within a frame. Death undoes us less sometimes than the hope that it will never come. Almost eight months after the Japanese tsunami, he writes, I accompanied the Dalai Lama to a fishing village that had been laid waste by the natural disaster. Gravestones lay tilted at crazy angles where they had not collapsed altogether. What once a year before had been a thriving network of schools and homes was now just rubble. Three orphans barely out of kindergarten stood in their blue school uniforms to greet him outside of a temple that had miraculously survived the catastrophe. Inside the wooden building by its altar were dozens of colored boxes containing the remains of those who had no surviving relatives to claim them all lined up perfectly in a row behind framed photographs of young and old. As the Dalai Lama got out of his car, he saw hundreds of citizens who had gathered on the street behind ropes to greet him. He went over and asked them how they were doing. Many collapsed into sobs. Please change your hearts, be brave, he said, while holding some and blessing others. Please help everyone else and work hard. That is the best offering you can make to the dead. When he turned round, however, I saw him brush away a tear himself. The piece concludes as follows. The only thing worse than suffering, the, the only thing worse than assuming you could get the better of suffering, I began to think, though I'm no Buddhist, is imagining you could do nothing in its wake. And the tear I'd witnessed made me think that you could be strong enough to witness suffering and yet human enough not to pretend to be the master of it. Sometimes it's those things we least understand that deserve our deepest trust. The most powerful line there to me is, is the one that says, the only thing worse than assuming you could get the better of suffering is imagining you could do nothing in its wake. It was the author Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who wrote, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding that fills them with compassion gentleness and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people, she writes, do not just happen. The events at Fukushima have called forth acts of genuine heroism and we have been witness to great victories of the human spirit. I have witnessed the same in other contexts around the world in the actions of emergency responders, military personnel, and law enforcement officers. Women and men who, with the proper training and indoctrination, overcome every human instinct and when duty calls they run into that burning building saving lives when their every instinct should tell them to move away. In a more traditional Western paradigm this idea brings to mind the words of Admiral Rickover who wrote, responsibility is a unique concept 
It can only reside and adhere in a single individual. You may share it with others, but your portion is not diminished. You may delegate it, but it is still with you. You may disclaim it, but you cannot divest yourself of it. Even if you do not recognize it or admit its presence, you cannot escape it. If responsibility is rightfully yours, no evasion or ignorance or passing the blame can shift the burden onto someone else. Unless you can point your finger at the person who is responsible when something goes wrong, then you have never had anyone really responsible. I appreciate your kind attention and wish you a productive conference. Thank you.